Somebody said, if you want knowledge, go to college, but if you want wisdom, go to God. The scripture says that wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. We've been working together at getting the wisdom from the Word of God on how to conquer the influences that are around us, those evil influences that are like a mighty surging tide. Seems like the whole world is rushing precipitously towards a frightening tomorrow, and somehow Rather than getting swept in the currents of our time, we must know the principles that are necessary, enabling us to conquer the influence. And we've taken as our model from the pages of the Bible the story of four young men in the book of Daniel. Daniel was one of them. They were kidnapped from Jerusalem and brought into Babylon and forced to serve the king in the king's court. These four young men lived in a very evil environment. But the book of Daniel is so delightful for many reasons, one of which is that it tells us some of the principles that they live by, which enable them not only to mount up above the evil influences, but to conquer it and to change the evil, to change the tide of human events from evil to good and from uh, Satan to the kingdom of God. So we've been learning those principles, and so far, here's what we've learned. Number one, we've learned that children must be raised to maturity in a Babylon-free environment. That is, before they get to Babylon, these young men were trained and brought up in Judaism and uh, in the principles of God, and then when they got to Babylon, they could handle it. So our children today need to be raised in a Babylon-free environment, which is our homes, before they have to face the evils of the world. Secondly, we weren't learned that these young men learned to establish godly purposes in advance before they got to Babylon. They purposed in their hearts that they would not allow Babylon to defile them. And so we learned to establish godly purposes and how to do that. Then we learned the importance of covenant friendships. These four young men had each other and little others, but together they stood. For the Bible says that two are better than one, two friends are better than one friend, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. So the importance of having three friends at least, that you are bound together by conviction, going the same direction, helping one another out and strengthening one another, enables us to conquer the influence of Babylon and that which is around us. And then fourthly, we have learned that we needed to maintain, as they did, a moment-by-moment -moment contact with God. And that's very important. Then that's the question that you and I face today. Are we directable? Is God free to direct us if and when in the direction of His choosing? Uh, is He free to do that? Are we capable of hearing from Him? Now, we have learned how to maintain contact with God. And here's what we learn, so, uh, first of all. We learn that we must understand the Word in order to stay in contact with God. God's will is in God's Word. Secondly, we learn to stay in contact with God by seeking the Lord in prayer. And then by acknowledging the rulership of God over our lives by kneeling. So that's why the psalmist said, come let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Kneeling is bowing down, giving reverence, acknowledging His leadership over us. And so we do that by kneeling, and they did that in the book of Daniel. And then we seek the Lord with fasting. It's the opposite side of prayer. Prayer is reaching out, as it were, to touch the hem of the garments of divine grace. Fasting has to do with letting go of the things that would distract us, whether it be food or reading or newspapers or whatever it is. Uh, so we fast and we seek the Lord by letting go of other distractions and then by maintaining the confession of our faith. And we spent great delightful times in learning Daniel's confession before praying. And then, of course, by repenting. You see, one thing that separates us from God is our sin. And, of course, another thing is our iniquities. Uh, one scripture says, Behold, the hand of the Lord is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear deaf that he cannot hear, but our iniquities have separated us from the Lord our God. 
If we're going to maintain contact with God, then we need to repent over anything that would get in between us and God. That's part of maintaining contact with God. And then we learn that we must receive and follow directions from God. We must be steerable, directable by God. That's why the scripture said, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. So what we want to talk to today is how do you receive directions from God? How can you know God is leading you? How do you know what his will is for your life? How do you know whether you should turn to the left or to the right or go straight or back up? How do you get directions from God? So I want you to make sure to give attention to these first verses, which are the foundation from which I'll show you some of the principles of Scripture by which you can know of a certainty, and as surely as you're listening to my voice today, that God is directing your life. First of all, I want you to know that God wants to direct you. Now let's look at the Scripture. It is written, and that a wonderful way to start. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Now watch this again. You see, it's that natural eye hasn't seen, the natural ear hasn't heard, and it hasn't entered into the natural heart the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. But watch this next verse now. But God hath revealed them. What? To them. The things that haven't entered into the eyes or the ears or the heart. He has revealed them unto us. Look at this. By his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Watch this now. Because while it doesn't come into the natural eye, ear, or heart, God's spirit searches what is the mind of God and wants to reveal it unto us. Now watch this. For what man knows the things of another man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Let's pause there for a moment. Do you know that you can know the condition of another, another person without getting a written report? You can read one another's spirit and know their mental, emotional, and spiritual condition just by reading the spirit. And that's because you have a spirit that resounds and it's invisible, it's this link between two people, and we discern the condition of one another because we are both spirit. Watch this now. What knoweth the things of man, say the spirit of man, which is in him. Now watch this. Even so, in other words, look at this, in the same way, the things of God knoweth no man. So don't go looking for another man to tell you what God's will is for your life. Watch this now. The things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. He knows the things of God. Now look at the great encouragement in this next verse. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Now watch this. Why? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God that you might freely know. You know, in the old days, they, looked, they searched after signs, like Gideon's fleece. Uh, twice he used a fleece. And um, in fact, Jesus comes along and says, well, it didn't work that way anymore. He said, in fact, an evil and adulterous generation seek after signs, but it shall not be given them. You see, God has a very much more effective communication system for us today he has put his spirit within us, this spirit which knows the things of the Father and of the Son, okay? And he wants us to know these things freely that are given to us of God. Now watch this. Which things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teach, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual with spiritual. You know, another verse says, uh, Jesus said this. He said, they're going to call you up before councils. And when they do that, you don't need to premeditate. Don't take no thought what you shall say, for in the selfsame moment it shall be given you, and it shall not be you that speak, but it shall be the Holy Spirit. Isn't this delightful that we can be directed 
because God's Spirit is in us and teaches us things comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now watch the next verse. But the natural man, that's the man without the Spirit of God. But the natural man receiveth not the things of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Look at this. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned and they haven't got the spirit in them that corresponds to the spirit of God. It's like there's radio broadcasts going through the air, but they haven't been able to tune into the right frequency. And just because you haven't got a radio that can pick up the frequency doesn't mean that frequency is not in the air. The natural man is not tuned to the Spirit of God, and that's why he doesn't get it. But you and I can know the things that are freely given to us of God because he sent his Spirit to give it to us. Now watch this. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. That means he makes decisions about all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. Now watch this. For who hath known the mind of God? Is there anybody that he may instruct him? Now watch this. But well, we have the mind of Christ. All right, now jot this down in your notes. How to receive instructions from God. Number one, we must understand the Word. The only way to be more spiritual is to be more scriptural. The Word of God is the will of God. Now secondly, we learn from the scripture that we can listen to his voice. Did you know that if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can hear God speak to you? No, no, no. If you had a machine that measured the audio level, you wouldn't pick it up because the voice is an inner voice. In fact, Jesus put it this way. Let's look at the scripture. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now, here were all the sheep, all mixed in together around Jerusalem, let's say, in the oriental shepherding of sheep, and it was time for the shepherd to leave Jerusalem and go. He would just start speaking, and out of that mass of sheep, there were his sheep who knew his distinct voice, and they would follow him. Just leave all the other sheep behind and follow him. And with all the voices going on in the world and shouting and screaming to be heard in our ears, you see, we, we, we know his voice. And he knows us. And we follow him because amidst the noise of the world, we get to hear his voice. You can actually hear his voice. Do you know how many times it says in the Bible and the Lord said, and God said. It occurs thousands of times. God is still speaking today, and Jesus says we can hear his voice. Number two, number three, rather. You can actually see the will of God. You say, well, how can I see the will of God? You can actually see the will of God. You can see the will of God, and I submit to you that you see it in your imagination. Now, before we go on, let me recap that verse. The eye hath not seen, the natural eye hath not seen, the natural ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the natural heart, but God hath revealed it to us by His Spirit. These things, we hear it with spiritual ears and we can see it. Maybe not with our eyes, but in our imagination you can actually see the will of God. Did you know that Satan shows you his will for your life? By stirring up evil imaginations in you? What's going on? Is that Satan is showing you his will for your life? Well, God wants you to be able to visualize. Somebody said, if you don't see it before you see it, you'll never see it. You can see it in your mind. You can see it in your imagination. You can see. It's like God will actually draw pictures in your imagination and show you his will for your life. Did you know that Jesus could see the will of his Father? Look at this. Jesus, referring to himself, said, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. Now watch this. For the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things. How could Jesus see the will of his Father? 
Now, I don't understand what I'm about to tell you, but, uh, uh, and that's not, it's, it's just simply a weakness that I have. It's not that it's unreasonable, it's just beyond my reason. It's above my understanding. Here's the explanation Jesus gives us. Look at what Jesus said. I don't understand this, but Jesus indicated to us that he was in heaven at the same time he was on earth. Here's the scripture. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, referring to himself, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now, I don't understand that. But in some spiritual, mystical sense, Jesus was seated in heaven at the same time he was earth, and he could see what the Father wanted him to do. In fact, the Scripture says that we too are, look at this, he has raised us up, together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That's why we can see the will of God as well. Now watch this. <clears throat> you can understand the word. or You get the will of God by understanding God's word, by listening to his voice, by seeing in your imagination, and fourthly, by recognizing his deposits in our hearts. You know, many people, and I want you to look at this verse, for it says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he will give thee the desires, look at this, he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now, there's two ways of interpreting this phrase. He is going to give you the desires that you got in your heart. Well, you might have the wrong desires. I might have the wrong desires. But this phrase could properly be understood. Watch this that he shall give thee the desires of your heart. He shall give you the desires for your heart, of your heart. Put them in you. Plant them in you. So you know the will of God by the word of God. You can hear his will. You can hear him. You can see the will of God. And sometimes he just puts it in our hearts. In fact, that's the implication of the next verse that follows this one. Commit thy way to the Lord. Trust also in him. He shall bring it to pass. Bring it to pass, referring to the former verse, those desires that he puts in our hearts. Now, there's one more way that you can get divine direction. First of all, remember, understand the Word of God. Number two, we hear his voice. Number three, we can see it in our imagination. And number four, um, we can recognize he's put something in our hearts, a desire. It's his will. And the last fifth one we want to talk about for a moment is to receive godly dreams. Now, don't turn me off yet because this may seem mystical to you and it's not all that mystical, but it's very real. Receiving godly dreams. And in fact, the next time we get together, we're going to talk about how to handle the four different causes of dreams. But sufficient for now, let me point out to you from the scripture that there are four causes of dreams. Number one, the first cause of dreams is busyness. Look at this from the scriptures. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business. You're not just busy, you got a whole bunch of busynesses going all at the same time. And when you go to sleep at night, all that busyness catches up with your subconscious and causes all kinds of dreaming through the night. So the first cause of dreams is a whole lot of busyness. Now the second cause of dreams, according to scripture, is our own ego or our vain thinking. Here's the scripture. For in the multitude of dreams, in many words, there are diverse vanities. And this vainness of man, this egocentricity, this exalted ego that seeks to rule in life, has a way of projecting its desires into our sleep, into our dreams. And uh, let's look at another verse about this. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, now watch this, don't let your prophets nor your diviners that be in the midst of you, watch you, deceive you. Now watch this, neither... Hearken to your dreams. Now watch this phrase, because this is critically important. Which ye cause to be dreamed. You can cause dreams to be dreamed. 
simply by the projection of your own desires, your vain thinking, our own uh, egocentricity projected ambitiously and we dream, dream, dream in the day and we go to bed at night and our dreams are filled and, they're, and those dreams come not just from busyness but they come from this exalted ego. In fact, sometimes when we dream, not all the time, but sometimes when we dream, we get dirty ideas in our dreams, morally unclean ideas. And sometimes, look at these, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. They despise dominion. They speak evil dignity. It's a whole description of people who are able to project their immorality into their sleep and dream immoral subject matter. Well, the third cause of dreams, according to the Bible, is what we call satanic imposition. Um, you remember Satan in the Old Testament appeared to God by the way, he doesn't do that anymore. God used to listen to Satan because Satan had legal authority in the Bible, or excuse me, on the earth. But after Calvary, Satan lost his legal authority and he no longer has free access to heaven. God is no longer obliged to speak to him. See, God's the God of law and follows his own laws. And since Satan was a legal authority on the earth, God had no option if he's going to stay lawful but to listen to Satan. And they had a conversation, see, and uh, here was what the question was. Satan says, does Job serve you for not? Does he so serve you for nothing? Or he only serves you because of what he gets out of it? Because we know that the whole book of Job is a contest with Satan trying to prove that Job's only motive for serving God was the blessing. And so here's what God said to Satan. You can, you can test Job. All that he hath is in your power. Watch this. Only upon himself. Don't put your hand. You can't mess with him personally. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord to carry out this test. And one of the things Satan do, did with Job, and he still does it today. Now watch this. Look at this next scripture. Because this is what jo uh, Satan did to Job. He scared him with dreams. Look at this. Here in the book of Job, then thou scarest me, look at this, scarest me with dreams. You terrify me through visions. They were so bad that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than life. You see, Satan has the ability to break in in a testing way to your dream life. It's one of the reasons, by the way, you want to cleanse any satanic emblems from your home altogether. They give legal right to Satan. So, Satan tries to impose. Now, fourthly, the fourth cause of dreams is what we call divine intervention. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. Look at this. My reigns, the controls of my life, he instructs me in the night seasons. Look at this, look at this. Where is God my maker who gives songs in the night? Did you know so wonderfully that God is able to break into your sleep? Not to disrupt it, but to give you rest and peace and communicate with you? The scriptures are replete with God speaking to people in their sleep, even to the unconverted. Look at this. God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, God can speak through dreams. Look at this next verse. And God said unto him in a dream. Look at this. Said unto him in a dream. I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. Remember Jacob. He dreamed. And he beheld a ladder set on the earth that reached right up into heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on the ladder. Now watch on the ladder. And uh, behold the angels of God. And look at this. And behold the Lord stood above it and said... This was in a dream. Well, my goodness. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Oh, listen, God came to Laban, the Syrian, in a dream by night and said unto him. See, God can actually speak in dreams. Now, um, <clears throat> let's look at one more. 
And he said, hear my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known on him in a vision and will speak to... Oh, let me just back that up again. And will speak unto him in a dream. Over and over again. In fact, in Gibeon, the Lord appeared unto Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give you. Look at this scripture. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet men perceiveth it not. Look at this now. So in a dream, in a vision of the night, when sleep falleth upon men and the slumberings upon bed. Oh, Joseph uh, talked to, said to Pharaoh, the dream of the Pharaoh is one that God has showed Pharaoh what's about to happen. In fact, uh, the mother of Jesus and Joseph uh, were warned by God in a dream. Now the problem today is that dreams can be very misleading. In fact, let's look at one scripture here. I've heard what the prophets said, and they prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. So dreams can be very misleading. But remember, God speaks to you, directs you with his word, talks to you in a voice, shows you pictures in your imagination. And in fact, he puts deposits in your heart, and he can show you in a dream. And the next time we get together, we're going to learn how to deal with these four kinds of of dreams. Have you ever wondered where all those weird and wonderful dreams came from that you had during your sleep? Well, we've been learning that the Bible teaches that there are four basic causes of dreams. The first cause is busyness. By the multitude of busyness cometh the dream. Secondly, we learn that dreams can be self-projected of your own personal values, beliefs, and conduct into your sleep life. And so we call this self-caused. And then there's satanic imposition. The enemy, Satan, tries to bring into your sleep his ideas and disrupt your life. And then we learn that God also is able to intervene in our sleep and instruct us as we're going to see in just a few moments. Well, these are the four causes, but the question really that we want to learn the answers to today is how do you handle dreams? Each of these four kinds of dreams. How do you handle a dream that is caused by busyness? Now look at this text, because here it is. For a dream, look at this, a dream cometh through the multitude of busyness. It's not just being busy, it's being busy and busy and busy, several layers on top of one another. I'd like you to take a look at this diagram because God's intention is, first of all, that our sleep life be reflective of a spirit-controlled life. Now, watch here what happens. Number, uh, watch here now, because along comes busyness and overlays, takes over, and each one of these jagged points on the diagram represent a different kind of busyness. And this busyness, as you can see, comes into our sleep life and affects us. And then, in fact, watch here now, because that same busyness carries right over here into our sleep and is disruptive. On another occasion, we're going to talk about uh, how uh, God has organized for each of us various sources of rest. Some people can sleep 12 hours and not get much rest. We learned a few weeks ago in uh, previous teaching how you can get more rest in a shorter period of time, for example, through the principle of meditation. But watch here now, because <clears throat> uh, how should you deal with this? And the answer is, you should live a spirit-controlled life. And that way, the busyness will not be there and thus not get into your sleep. So, a spirit-controlled life, watch the diagram, will bring a peaceful, regular sleep here and a level uh, way of life. But the question becomes, what if you haven't lived a spirit-controlled life and instead you've been busy, 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 busy? What should you do? So here's the second answer. If you've been busy, 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 then number two, create a devotional zone before you go to bed. Now watch this because this is critically important. Watch the diagram now. We're talking about creating a devotional zone here 
before you begin your sleep here. And in this devotional zone, you can get ready for restful sleep. Isolating, watch the diagram with me one more time, isolating this busyness from the sleep by a devotional zone. Well, what should you do in a devotional zone? What should you do in this little parenthesis before sleep and after a busy, busy, busy day? Well, number one, uh, I think uh, repentance is a good idea. Repenting of the cause of busyness so that this doesn't become a lifestyle for you. So in this devotional zone, you say, oh, God, I've been so busy. I need to slow down now. And, uh, and, and in fact, did you know that God gives us certain items that should always be dealt with before we go to sleep? For example, look at this scripture with me. Be angry and sin not. Now watch this because God puts a time limit on dealing with anger. He says, be angry, sin not, and don't let the sun go down on your reaction or your anger, uh, and don't go to sleep with that because it will trouble your sleep. So God puts a time limit on dealing with anger. Don't go to bed with anger before the sun goes down. You want to deal with it. Now watch the next part of the same scripture. Neither give place to the devil. You do not want to allow Satan into your sleep life. So during, look at this now on the diagram, at this devotional zone here, we want to repent of all this cause and change that and get back to living a spirit-controlled uh, life. Well, the second thing that you should do during this devotional zone is you should, notice here, you should release. You need to release, you need to let out of you all the psychological, mental, emotional, and even spiritual dynamics of an overly too busy life. Now, how do you do that? Well, let me show you because it's a part of a praying. Here's what the scripture says. For with stammering lips and another tongue shall he speak to this people. Now watch this next verse. And he says, this is the rest wherein ye may cause the weary to find rest. Now look at this. And this is the refreshing. There's a moment in this devotional zone. We repent and then we release. We let it out of us and it may come in worship and praise and stammering lips. And it's just an emptying out of us all of those psychological dynamics during this dev devotional zone so that they don't penetrate our sleep time. Then the third thing we should do during this uh, devotional zone is reprioritize our lives. Put things back in sequence, back in order. Now, it's delightful to understand that the Bible helps us do that. Look at the scripture. Order my steps in thy words. So we learn to put our life back in order. Then the fourth thing you can do during this devotional zone is to begin the pleasant murmuring of Scripture, repeating a Scripture over and over. This we call meditation. And the Scripture says, as you can see it on your screen, my meditation of Him shall be sweet. But what do you do, watch well, the diagram, if you didn't have a devotional zone here, and you're already, look at there now, you're already in your sleep, and you're dreaming. What should you do? Well, here's the answer. Wake up and get up and chase away your dream. Now look at this scripture. He shall fly away as a dream. Look at this. Fly away as a dream. Now watch this. And shall not be found. Now watch this. He shall be chased away as a vision of the night. You can chase a dream away if you're awake enough to do it. So you wake up and you get up and you chase the dream away. Now watch the diagram. Because after, watch the diagram, after you have chased this dream away, what you want to do now, in fact, let me go to the next slide, watch this, you want to create a devotional zone in the middle of the night. It may be a lot briefer, but you want to follow those previous directions on how to have a devotional zone, and then watch this, after this, you want to return now to what we would understand to be a normal, restful sleep. That's what to do with busyness caused dreams. Now, what do you do with, what is the solution to self-induced dreams? 
What if the dreams that you've got come from our own psychological projection into sleep? Look at this. In the multitude of dreams are many words and there are diversities of vanities. Now watch another scripture. Neither hearken to the dreams, now watch this, which ye cause to be dreamed. You can cause dreams. You can mentally, emotionally, spiritually set your life up so that when you go to sleep at night, it carries over your values, your beliefs, and, and those kind of things. So let's look at a diagram that illustrates this. In fact, here's a phrase from Scripture. It refers to filthy dreamers. Now watch here. Because what we're seeing is that your selfish, egocentric desires can be brought over here into the sleep area. In fact, here it is right in front of you. And so what happens here is we get these disturbances in our sleep, and what they really are is projections of our own selfishness. <clears throat> Look at the scripture with me. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Now watch the scripture. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Now what happens here is that back here we have wicked intentions these get into our sleep, and that's why I've made these little curlies here, because like the trouble, see, they cast up wider and dirt, and that's what happens in our sleep. So let me show you one more verse of Scripture about this. Because what we're doing is reaping in our sleep life that which we've sown in our awake life. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But I want you to see something really good now. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Watch the diagram. Whatever is going on over here will go on over here. And what we need if your self projected ego into your dream is disturbing, then what we do, what we need is the redemption of the self. That's the solution. You change, back to the diagram, you change what's here. So it will change the effect over here. How do you do that? So in your notes, jot this down. Number one, we must bring the self or the ego under the control of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Scripture says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus as the Lord, you'll be saved from this. So what we want to do is take this ego that's out of control. And by the way, everybody should do this. This is what it means to be a genuine Christian. Who wants to live driven by an eagle that's a mile high and that drives and pushes, knows no boundaries, forces us to be what we don't want to be, do what we don't want to do? That's why the greatest thing that can ever happen in anybody's life on this planet is to take their self, to take their ego and bring it under the control of Jesus. Oh, what a great start that is. Now watch here. The second thing you want to do is clear your conscience of any resolve, unresolved guilt. For if we confess our sins, isn't this delightful? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So a cleansing that takes place here will change the effect on our sleep over here. And then the third thing you want to do if it's a self-caused dream, is you want to carry righteous thoughts into your sleep. And look what they will do for you according to Scripture. This is so delightful. When you go, it will lead you these righteous thoughts. When you sleep, look at this. When thou sleepest, it will keep you. And when you awake, it will talk to you. Let's look at another verse that's very similar. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. You will lie down and your sleep shall be sweet. Oh, we've got to look at another one. Upon this I awaked and I beheld. And look at this. Jeremiah says, And my sleep was sweet unto me. The redemption of the ego, so that it no longer projects into our sleep life vile, immoral, ugly, wicked imaginations and dreams. Well, what do you do? And what's the solution if your dream is caused by Satan? 
Let's look at a couple of scriptures. Number one, the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. He wants to get you in your weakest moment, which often is when we're asleep. So we are to resist him steadfastly in the faith. Now, watch the diagram, because this is critically important. Did you notice that? Satan comes to impose himself into your sleep. Now, let me take you to some scripture and give you a brief explanation to the opening of the book of Job. Because Satan does something that he's no longer, by the way, allowed to do. Satan once had access to heaven, to God. Did you know that? And I always ask myself, because the book of Job opens with a conversation between God and, and Satan. And I say to myself, if God's so good and Satan's so bad, why are they on talking terms? And the answer to that is very simple. You see, God is a God of law. He doesn't violate the laws he makes. Satan used to have and used to be the legal authority on the earth. So God was obligated to respond to the legal authority on the planet. So they're having a conversation. By the way, since Jesus went to the cross, that's all changed. Satan was cast down out of heaven at the cross, no longer access to the Father accusing you before God day and night. But here in the book of Job he is. So the question in the book of Job was this. Satan says, God, does Job serve you for nothing? Does he serve you for not, for nothing? And God says the answer is yes. Satan says, no, God, J Satan, uh, excuse me, Job only serves you because of the goodies he gets out of it. And if he wasn't such a blessed man, he would walk away from you. God says, I'll let you test him. And so one of the tests, and isn't it wonderful that we discover that Satan was wrong and God was right. That we do not serve God for the blessing, even though there is blessing. But even if there were no blessing, we, like Job, say, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. You see, because our motive, we like the blessing, but it's not based on the blessing. It's based on the fact that God is right. Now, one of the tests that Job did, or excuse me, Satan did for Job, was that he scared him with dreams. And look at this. Here's the scripture. Then thou scares me with dreams. You terrify me through visions. So much so that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than life. These dreams that Satan brought to Job were so upsetting and so terrifying that he says he didn't know if he could handle it. By the way, Look at the diagram with me, because one of the events, uh, one of the problems of dreams is this, that they can affect your conscious life after you wake up. Now, those dreams can be very, very scary when Satan imposes himself into your sleep. In fact, let's look at a scripture in more detail. Now, a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof. Now, watch this. In thoughts, thoughts from the visions of the night. Watch this. Because you can have thoughts that come from the visions of the night here that go on into your conscious life and damage your waking hours. Now watch Job's description of Satan's interfering with his sleep through dreams. Fear came on me and trembling, which made my bones to shake. Now watch this, because in his dream, it was so real, this is how he described it. And then a spirit passed before my face, and the hair of my flesh stood up. This was not just a dream, this was Satan being there. Look at it, Job says, it stood still, but I couldn't discern the form of it. I saw the form of Satan. An image was before my eyes and there was silence and then I heard a voice. Satan can damage your sleep and intrude into your life. So the question now becomes, what's the solution? How do we handle dreams that are caused by Satan? And the answer is, number one, we must deal with Satan. 
Look at the diagram with me. If Satan is doing this, and he is the cause here, then we have to deal with him. And isn't this wonderful? Because here's how we deal with God. Uh, excuse me, with Satan. God helps us. Enter God. God comes. See it in the diagram. He comes here to deal with the dream, and God comes here to deal with Satan as well. So how do you get God to help you deal with the Satan and with the dream? Well, number one, you want to wake up and get up, if you're able to. I had a dream one time, like as we've just described. I couldn't get up, but I could wake up. And there upon the weakness of my bed with that demonic oppression, I learned to do the following scriptures. So what do you do after you wake up? Number two is you submit to God and resist Satan. Here's what the scripture says. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. That's number one. Number two, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, don't miss this because lots of people try resisting the devil and he doesn't flee. That's because the first step is submit to God first, then resist the devil, and then he will flee. You cannot get Satan to flee without submitting to God because you see it's this power of this wonderful Jesus. It's this wonderful Holy Spirit. It is the very presence of God as you submit to him that comes into your life and empowers you to send Satan flame. How do you submit to God? Well, you submit to God by crying out to him. Now watch the diagram with me, because this is what happens. Did you see? That dream gets changed, and God comes and pushes back Satan. Now there's one more thing you should do. And that one more thing is that you should draw near to God. Because this verse says, submit to God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you, and then draw nigh to God, and God will draw nigh to you. Why is that necessary? Because if you and God are close, this is the best form of prevention of any future dream you could ever have. And then you can truly say, like the apostle said, greater is he that's within you than he that's out there in the world. And the scriptures tell us that we are to resist Satan steadfastly, in the faith. Look what Jesus said. Behold, I'm giving you power to tread on serpents and ser uh, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now watch this next verse. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the, look at this, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Don't miss this. Look at the text again with me. We are not to make this the basis of a rejoicing. What makes us rejoice is that our names are written in heaven. But that does not disannul the fact that spirits are subject unto you because Jesus comes into you and gives you the power. Well, you might be asking, what gives Satan the right anyhow to impose on us? The answers, jot them in your notes. Number one, he may not have the right. He might just do it anyhow because he is lawless and doesn't obey the law. Secondly, Satan might do it because we have made a choice to follow Satan in an area of our life. If we're disobedient to God in an area of our life, we give legal opportunity. Now, I want you to catch what I said. You give Satan legal opportunity. He has the legal right to impose on your sleep because of our disobedience, because of our sinfulness. And, and thus he comes. Well, the third reason why Satan might have the right to impose on us is because we allow the presence of some evil thing in our lives. It might be music. If you listen to demonized music, by doing so, you bring a presence into your life that gives him legal right because you said yes to devil-worshipping music. It might be through videos. It amazes me today how people, some of us who even call ourselves Christians, can be entertained 
by adultery and fornication and violence and murder. And, and then we do that. We give Satan the rest. That's why you need to cleanse your home of every defiling form of music and every defiling video. Get it out. It might come in the way of art, a picture on the wall. It could be an artifact, some relic, some piece of jewelry that is uh, immoral, demonic in its source, uh, from some evil spirit. Could be a symbol of an adulterous relationship, such as a ring that's not disposed of. It could be symbols in our clothing. That's why you want to cleanse your home. Give, remember, give no place to say, not even that much. Go through your home. Is there anything there that's stolen? Anything there you haven't paid for? Is there anything there that is contrary to the holy and righteous words of God? Now, by the way, if you have such a thing, do not give those things to somebody else. You burn them. That's what they did in the book of Acts. They gathered their books, their curios, their music, and had a big bonfire and destroyed it. And God commands us a number of times in Scripture that when we have things that are an abomination to Him, don't try and get money at them because then that money is defiled. Absolutely destroy them. Don't give them to anybody else. And that's how we must deal was Satan, radically, fundamentally, uh, without compromise. And if you have anything at all, I can't tell you how many stories I know. Sickness in a baby, in a baby's body, fevered, until the parents discovered hanging on the wall. Imagine, hanging on the wall, a simple demonic symbol that gave Satan the legal right to be there. So... Get rid of it. This is, this is, in fact, what happened in Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel. They couldn't drink what everybody else drank. They couldn't sing to the music. They couldn't listen to the music. They couldn't wear the clothes because astrological symbols were woven into the fabric of their clothes. And that's what we must do if we're going to stop the intervention of Satan into our dreams. Now, the next time we get together, I'm going to answer the question, what do we do if the dream comes from God? I know you want to hear the answer to that.